You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number 295. Hi and welcome to part three of the Outdoors Show compilation of interviews uh, recently recorded at the Outdoors Show uh, down at the NEC. Now, as uh, you may have been aware from part one and part two, um, Andy and I basically met up, we had a coffee, and then we went our own ways hunt- hunting down interesting and informative people to have a word with. So amidst all the clamour and clatter of the noise in the background, uh, we got chatting to uh, new and old friends alike. Um, the Lake District is, uh, without doubt, the number one uh, most popular destination for for walkers and, uh, and bikers in the UK. Of course, there are two centres of it. There's uh, Kendall in the south, and I much prefer Keswick in the north. I've got Linda here from, uh, from Keswick. Linda, come on, just remind us of the range of things that are on offer locally. Oh, Keswick's just wonderful. We've got the most wonderful lake, which is Derwent Water, fabulous range of mountains, peace, wilderness, it's wonderful. We've produced a new adventure directory because there are no end of companies offering. You can go on guided walks, you can go the highest uh, climb, you can climb Fleetwood Pike from the outside. There are water events. You can even walk on water in Keswick. Did you know that? No, but uh, I've heard it said that Wainwright often thought he could. <laughs> I'm sure he did, yeah. We've just got so much to do in Keswick. And, and the quality of accommodation in Keswick has gone really, really good at the moment. There's some fabulous accommodation in Keswick. It's a wonderful centre. You can spend all day doing all your activities in the wonderful hills that we've got. Come back, have a really good local beer, local food, and really good bed for the night. And one of the things that strikes me about it is that, uh, it's, it's particularly these days... The whole tourist infrastructure interacts well, doesn't it? So if you were somebody that used to do a lot of walking when you were younger and you've maybe maybe now got a young family, it's more difficult. This is a great place to get kids and the rest of the family into the outdoors for the first time. Oh, it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. We've got great campsites for a start with new things like camping pods and we've got yurts and things which are great for families. So you don't even have to bring your own tent? You don't have to bring your own tent, no. the yurts are great, aren't they? And the yurts are fantastic. Really, really luxurious. But there are great things that you can do. There are safe cycle paths to get them out. We're just cycling for the first time. We've got railway paths. No traffic. Absolutely great. There are sailing companies. You can go out in rowing boats, get them on kayaks, dragon boats, really fun things for the kids. And once they're outside and they start off with these adventures, there's no stopping them, is there? And of course, the great thing about this, uh, this, this diary that you, uh, and, the, and the information you've got here is that you know, in the UK we do have to worry about the weather, but that doesn't have to stop us having a great time. No, no, absolutely not. I've got a range of activities here. Keswick Climbing Wall, they've got a, it's like a huge barn, they throw open the doors. Inside, it's multicoloured climbing walls for all ages, and you think you're climbing on the outdoors, and it just gets kids used to climbing. There's all kinds of activities inside and outside that you can do, and it just gets them away, you know out of the house, out of their Xbox and they're just away doing all these wonderful things they'll do forever Well it's a very special place and if you haven't been there yet you certainly should do and uh, it looks to me as if the future of Keswick is, uh, is just as bright Certainly is, yes Great Linda, thanks very much Walking around the NEC, there's a real mix of, uh, obviously, gadgets and uh, items associated with the outdoors. Uh, there are walking festivals and uh, UK-based attractions, and there are also um, some small stands from our European compatriots, uh, places that perhaps uh, sound uh, interesting, certainly from the photographs they look very interesting, um, but we hear very little about, as regards practically how we get there and what it's like to actually walk or camp or cycle, or whatever, um, in that particular country. Uh, one area area of which is uh, Slovenia. Had a lovely little stand, some fantastic images. Uh, so I spoke to Marko Lenacic, who's the Director of Hiking and Biking in Slovenia, uh, and asked him if he actually gets many visitors from the UK uh, visiting their wide open spaces. Yes, Great Britain and uh, British people are one of the most popular tourists in Slovenia. So that's why we are coming here in Birmingham and also in London Paris. So just talk me through, if you would, um, how easy it is for somebody from, uh, from the UK to get to Slovenia and where they start looking for information about going hiking. Yes, of course, uh, we have fl- regular flight connections, uh, London Ljubljana Airport, every day. 
And of course we have also possibilities to fly uh, to Trieste or to Klagenfurt from London or Birmingham and from Manchester. These are regular flights. Uh, so, uh, and presumably you can get easy access to Slovenia from Austria as well? Yes, uh, from Klagenfurt Airport is just half an hour to Slovenia or one hour to capital, Ljubljana, or in this Julian Alps uh, hiking possibilities, just half an hour. So, easy accessible from... So, Slovenia itself, I, I know nothing about Slovenia. Um, if I were wanting to, to visit for um, a, a holiday during the summer, um, can I just arrive and do you have lots of established hiking routes or do you have to go through a booked, uh, booking through a company? Uh, uh, hiking in Slovenia is very easy. It's possible all year round, but in summertime, it's our most interesting peaks in Julian Alps and Alpine region. And uh, of course, all these mountain trails are very good signed. So you can walk alone, or maybe you you hire a guide, or just uh, book through through agencies. But uh, we have over 7,000 kilometers of uh, well-marked uh, trails, and it's possible to walk alone. Okay, so if I went on one of these trails, um, do you have plenty of campsites, or are there hostels that people use? Uh, we have uh, yeah plenty of uh, smaller or bigger campsites. We have a lot of lakes and. Uh, in mountains, we have uh, over 150 uh, mountain huts. I mean that if you walk two, two three hours, you can get, uh, you can reach a mountain hut everywhere. Now, what about the, what are the rules on on wild camping? Camping away from the huts or away from campsites? Uh, is it specifically forbidden, or is that are people fairly easy on that? In Julian Alps, we have uh, Trigla National Park. There is forbidden for camping outside camping places. But uh, other places in Slovenia, it's possible to camp. But you have to ask, it's better to ask uh, owner of land to, to camp. Can you just give us an idea of, of, of cost of things? Obviously, it's very important to people these days. Um, you know, they, they want to spend their money as, as best they can. Um, in euros, uh, how much would it cost to have a, a room at a hotel or a hostel or campsites and, and food? What sort of prices should, should people be looking at on a daily basis? Yeah, overnights in uh, hotels are uh, in summertime, where it's a peak season, uh, so are around uh, between um, 30 and 40 euros. Private accommodation, 20, 25 euros camping uh, 10 euros per person or per car and hostels uh, below 10 euros so yes and and is food uh, what sort of amount of money would somebody be thinking of for food at either a hostel or or in a small village yeah food is possible to buy a food everywhere uh, food is relative cheap cheaper of course uh, as in uk but uh, in restaurants I don't know, it's uh, about a uh, meal, you can get meal for 12, 14 euros. Your, um, you've obviously got, there's a bit of coastline that touches on the Mediterranean. Um, are there many routes that take you around the coast at all, or are they all predominantly in the mountains? We have uh, two trans-Slovenian routes, which goes from one part of Slovenia to the coastline. This is uh, Slovenia High Trail called, and uh, the another one is Via Alpina which comes from Monaco, around the uh, Alpine region. And of course we have uh, regional routes to, and you can walk to the seaside. And a uh, final question would be, are there, is it fairly easy to get to the beginning and the end of these routes and then obviously get back to, uh, to the airport to, to get home? Uh, we have a lot of uh, circle routes, so you can uh, walk in circle, but of course a lot of agencies offer transfers you can start in one point and finish in another point and then you you can uh, get back by car or by public public transport yes excellent okay well the final question us would be uh, where can people find some more information uh, about uh, about slovenia yeah of course internet site uh, www.slovenia.info there is everything about slovenia uh, regarding offer and costs packages and you can also through these internet sites you can book your locations. It's all about the great outdoors. Podcasting around the world. Online, on demand, 
and always free. I think it's a splendid idea. This is, is the outdoor, outdoor station. station. I would just like to say, wow. More information, of course, can be found at www.slovenia.info. And, uh, yeah, it looked, it looked like a very exciting and interesting place to, to go to. And it also, uh, the wide open spaces is a, is a big attraction at the moment for me, anyway. Now, uh, of course, while I was wandering around, working, working hard, walking up and down the aisles, uh, Andy uh, never tries to veer too far away from the coffee machine, which also happened to be next to the Cicerone stand. And lo and behold, who should he see there but some old friends? Well, another year, another outdoor show, another Cicerone stand, and one of our oldest friends, Kev Reynolds, is with me. Kev, I always start by saying this, but what on earth have you been doing in the last 12 months? Uh, well, you're going to be shocked by this. I spent the summer in the South Downs. I think it was the first summer for about 42 years that I hadn't been in the Alps. And somebody was asking me recently at a lecture, he said, what the hell were you doing on the South Downs instead of being in the Alps? Well, of course, South Downs is going to be a national park, our next national park, opening next year, 2011. And I had a contract to write a book about it. And I can tell you that I had as much fun there walking and camping on the South Downs as I would have had if I'd been in the Alps. It, it's a stunning area, isn't it? And if you, get, if you get it in the summer with sunshine... And, yeah, I mean, I, I did quite a chunk of that about four or five years ago. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, I'd walked the South Downs way on on numerous occasions for the guide, uh, but you're walking through a corridor then, and you can always see something that, oh, if only I had time, I'd like to go and have a look at that. But this time I had time to go and have a look at that, those little hinted valleys and tiny villages and all sorts of things, and I had a wonderful time. And then at the end of that, end of the summer, I took a group off to Bhutan, my first visit there, and fell in love with it. I knew I would, but it exceeded all expectations. Then I was back from Bhutan for five days, and then hopped on a plane back to Kathmandu, where I led a, a group round Manas Lu, which is... I think um, it's truthful to say that it is my number one trekking destination in the Himalaya. Absolutely stunning. Now, I might have told you before that I've got a a nasty lung problem these days. Too much uh, high altitude, I think, and too many smoky Sherpa houses. Um, When I got up to about 4,500 metres, I was really struggling. And I thought I was going to have to turn back. But my good old Sirdar, Kierkan Sherpa, He said, no problem, he said, I'll find you a hearse. I said, a hearse? I'm not dying. And he said, no, a hearse to ride. (laughs) Ah, he meant a horse. (laughs) So sure enough, he found a Tibetan lady in the little village of Sando, and she got a hearse, or a horse, and, yeah, hired the use of this hearse for two days. Is that that quite common, or is it something you think that will expand... Uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, I can see that there's great potential for pony trekking in the Himalaya. Look for the future books. No, no I've, I've never come across anybody doing this before. So anyway, managed to get the use of this horse for a couple of days. It's a little Tibetan pony, to be quite honest. The only trouble is they use wooden saddles. And my bum is not used to any form of saddle. The last time I was on a horse was about 45 years ago. And after, well, half a day on this damn wooden saddle, I could feel that I got big problems coming on. At the end of the day, it was just awful. Two raw buttocks, to which we fitted Compede. Now, Compede is usually used for blisters on your feet, but um, my wife managed to find the right places to put these Compede on my bum. So the second day was not quite as painful as the first. The horse got me up to within about 150 vertical metres of the pass, by which time the snow was too deep. Poor old thing was sinking in, so I paid the lady off and uh, struggled over the pass. Two days later, I decided it was time to get rid of these compede. Now, you know how compede is like a second skin? Yeah, and they're they're not that big either. They're not that big, and it's very difficult to pick them off without picking skin off at the same time. And the hour that it took my wife to peel these compete off my bum inside the tent gave the rest of our group all sorts of reasons to speculate on what was going on in the tent. But it does, I guess, um, it's a trip that opens up new possibilities. The 
pony trekking book in the Himalaya, but also larger size compete. Well, serious, seriously, yeah. If I could find something, some extra padding for my bum, if I can find a way of doing trekking on a pony or taking a pony with me so that when my lungs really start to complain, I can hop on this beast to get me over some passes, I'm all for it. I mean, I'm, I'm quite serious about this, and um, um, I have my Sherpa friend who is sort of looking out for any possibility of doing this. So who knows? So a new chapter in Himalayan adventure begins with your sore bum. Well, yeah, yes, I, and I think I can get Compede in on this to uh, sponsor me. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, when you get old and crinkly and your lungs start giving out, don't give up. Find a horse and tell, a lot of compete. Now tell me a bit about Bhutan, because that's um, obviously in that part of the world. It has an, an exotic feel about it. But it's, 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 it's not been easy to get in, has it? It's easy to get in if you've got the money. I mean, they charge $200 a day just to be in the country. But that $200, I mean, it covers your accommodation your transportation and your food. If you want, if you've got the loot, you can pay more, of course, and stay in better quality. Uh, so how does this work? Do you get a pass that you can use on anything? You, ha- you have to go through a Bhutanese um, tourist company because 65% of that tw- $200 goes to the government. Now, you think, that's a bit greedy, but that is it to enable the local population to get by without having to pay any taxes. So the visitors are paying the taxes, if you like, paying for all, um, all the facilities that are there for the Bhutanese people. And I think that's a, a terrific thing. It is spectacularly beautiful. Architecture is to die for. The people are so openly friendly and colourful. It's almost 100% Buddhist, of course, so you've got the most exquisite monasteries all over the place. These lovely old zongs, which are medieval fortresses built in the valleys to protect them from marauding Tibetans in the days when Tibetans were marauding. And although I wasn't trekking there, I, it was a sort of a cultural tour I was, I was leading, I found every half hour to be so full of magic that I just can't wait to get back there again. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful country. Truly. Presumably there's a lot of space in terms of it not being overkilled by tourism. At the moment. No, that, that's right. The, the country is about the size of Switzerland, but it's got a population of less than a million. The capital, Timpu, is, I mean, tiny. Um, so there is bags of space, lots of beautiful, beautiful valleys with tiny little villages, hamlets, farmhouses tucked around. It hasn't been um, ruined by tourism as we we might say that Nepal has, or or shall we say heavily influenced by tourism. By limiting the number of visitors through this $200 a day, they're managing to maintain their culture. I mean, everybody wears a traditional dress, you know, just, just in their everyday lives. It is so, so colourful and beautiful. All the children at school, they learn all their lessons bar one in English. The one lesson they don't learn in English is the lesson teaching them their own language. Okay? So all the, everybody up to, I suppose, about the age of 30 speaks perfect English, better than we do, and will come up to you and chat to you. Uh, they're, they're very wise about what's going on in the outside world, but they're very proud of their own country, and rightly so. It's, it can't be Shangri-La. I mean, it looks like Shangri-La, and to, to the visitor who's there for two or three weeks, it will be Shangri-La, but I mean, you, there must be problems, but there's nothing evident. And I was just bewitched by the whole experience of being there. And I was asked to actually lead another group there this year, but damn it, the timing uh, gets in the way of my going to New Zealand <laughs> later in the year. So there you are. There is a, <coughs> there's a Cicerone guide, isn't there, to Bhutan? I don't think there it's is. one of yours. No, it's by a good friend of mine, Bart Jordans, who's a Dutchman. He actually lived there for four years because his wife works for the Danish... Um, well, one of the Danish ministries. And she had a posting, a four-year posting there. And for a guy who's a professional trek leader, that was heaven on earth. 
So he knows the country, or all the trekking routes there, better than almost anybody. And whilst I, I mean, I met him out there again uh, this year, or in, in Nepal, just as he was going off there, he was leading a 34-day trek across the, the northern borders with, with Tibet. Um, and, I mean, can you imagine, 34 days, $200 a day? It's a, price, a pricey thing, but it was, it was fully subscribed. He had 12 clients. It's nice right? to know in these times of recession there's still people that will do it. Well, I, I, it sounds a fantastic destination, and I, I suspect um, Jonathan and Leslie and Cicero would better prepare for another print one on that one. <laughs> now, New Zealand for next year? Yeah, this year. This year? Yes, yes. So what's the itinerary then? Uh, well, um, it's, it's very, uh, very open at the moment. Um, I'm starting in the early summer. I'm uh, working out a, a new hut-to-hut route in the Alps, or, in the Silvretta Alps, that's on the Swiss-Austrian border. Jonathan from Cicerone is coming with me, so that will be fun. We've already done a few trips together, and we're looking forward to this one. Then, short... Look after your publisher while you're on those high well, passes. Well, it's a publisher. got to look after me. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I think we're leaning on each other here. Then shortly after I get back from that, I'm due to lead a group for Mountain Kingdoms in Ladakh. And then uh, after that, uh, rewalking the Tour de Mont Blanc to update my guidebook. And then off to the Blue Mountains in Australia above Sydney for uh, two and a half weeks. And yeah, then from... People tell me those are fascinating. They're not the highest mountains, are they? But, uh... No, they're not. they're not. They're not as much mountains as an escarpment with deep ravines in them. But... Uh, I've got a sister-in-law who, who's actually lived there for nearly 50 years and it's time we went to visit her and so I might just have time to say how do before I get up into the hills. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a family visit but the situation is such that I shall make the most of it and then from I'm there sure we're going off, yeah, and from there off to uh, New Zealand to the Southern Alps to uh, get some exercise again there. Oh, great. Well, have a lovely time, and we'll catch up again at some time, sometime during the, the next year. Kev is uh, as entertaining as ever, and uh, you're working hard this weekend. Yeah, I've got uh, one lecture and two seminars to do today, and tomorrow I've got two lectures and three seminars to do, so I could be talking for about five hours. So if I've got any voice left after that, well... I doubt it. My wife will welcome me with open arms because I shall be speechless when I get back home. This is the kind of thing that Paddy does without batting an eyelid, but mere mortals like us have more difficulties with pa- Paddy does five hours of talking for breakfast. <laughs> I've got to spread mine out. What subjects are you talking about? Uh, well, today, uh, trekking the high Himalaya. Tomorrow, I'm talking about the Pyrenees, long trails in the Pyrenees, and hut to hut in the Alps. And then we've got this series of seminars. Today, um, I'll be telling people how to organise your own trip to the Himalaya you know, do it on your own Uh, tomorrow I'm talking on uh, the Pyrenees um, about huts um, heaven or horror (laughs) you can see them from Uh, yeah, I've been to both of those (laughs) and uh, the other one tomorrow is what's the other one tomorrow? Blimey I can't remember. I'll better have a look at my programme. And, of course, you're available to repeat these at uh, walking clubs and things throughout the year? Well, I, I, yeah, I do between 40 and 50 lectures every winter. Uh, this, earlier this week, as you know, I was in uh, Stockport, uh, which was fun. I They're really enjoyed Lovely people, it. aren't they? They are lovely people. I did uh, um, Alpine Points of View for them on, uh, on Tuesday. I was, uh, I was lecturing in Scotland um, a few weeks ago, in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, which gave me an opportunity to get up to Glencoe when the conditions were absolutely fantastic, just like the Alps. Beautiful snow conditions, covered with frost, everything was sparkling like diamonds. Wonderful. Next day, the clouds were sitting on the rooftops and it was snowing like fury, so I got on a train and went to Edinburgh to do another lecture. So anybody wanting to book Kev, just look up Google, I guess, and uh, you'll come uh, up with your yeah. website. Yeah, Google me, www.kevreynolds.whatever the rest of it is, where it's co.uk, I think, possibly. <laughs> but anyway, you'll find me somewhere. Well, thanks for that. As ever, there's a queue of people looking for Kev Reynolds' autograph, so I'll leave you to it. Thanks a lot, Kevin. See you next year. Good to see you. Bye for now. Many people will know that the outdoor show is no longer going to be at the NEC and that it's moving down to London. Uh, The show is now owned uh, by Voss Media, 
And I spoke to the MD, Damien Normal, regarding the reason behind the changes of location, changes of date, uh, and also, as it was his first outdoors show that he'd run, what he'd thought of the day's attendance. Great start. Um, some very good queues in the morning, enthusiastic people. You know, Generally uh, a very good attendance for a Friday and kind of the right kind of weather. You know, not really sure what it's going to do. You don't want to be out in the hills uh, uh, immediately when you wake up in the morning because it's a beautiful day, but all, equally you want to do something. So I think we get people that have taken a day off work today that genuinely are enthusiasts in the outdoors. Well, certainly I've been here over the last five years and I've, I've walked across that car park many a time when it's been an icy, bitter, cold wind and it was a rather pleasant surprise this morning to uh, to have a pleasant walk in. Um, now, I understand you've taken over the, the, the running of the outdoor show, so uh, tell me what the future plans are. OK, um, well, we took over the running of it in June. It's exactly the same team uh, as we had before. It was a management buyout from the Daily Mail Group. And during that time, we run a strategic review over the events that we run. Um, we also own two other events, the Ski Show and the Vitality Show. And we did a lot of research into the market, speaking to a lot of the key players from the major retailers, such as the Snow and Rocks, Alice Brigham's, the Millets and Blacks, um, but also to a lot of brands, such as Berg House, North Face, um, who are conspicuous by their absence this year. And what we found was there was a, a general feeling that they... Um, were not getting their return on investment with the show um, in its current format at the NEC. So we needed to embark on a sort of fact-finding mission to find out whether, one, it was the format of the show that had changed and wasn't appearing, or two, whether it was the location and and how they felt about the show being there. And whilst the NEC works for many, many events, and there's some very successful shows here, Close Show Live, Gadget Show... uh, um, the general feeling was that you know, despite all of our efforts to really make um, this show as successful as it possibly could be in uh, the NEC, um, the power of the brands and the retailers um, were telling us very much that you needed to look at the location, you needed to look at the offering, which we then did. Um, we run the ski and snowboard show at Olympia in London, which is 40,000 people over five days. And a lot of those major retailers, such as Snow and Rock, Ellis Brigham, North Face as, as a brand, um, all support that show and uh, consistently support it year on year. So um, when we started looking at locations, we asked them why is it they support London and they don't support um, Birmingham. And the, the general feeling was that actually the perceived spend was higher. Um, whilst I'm sure a lot of people will disagree with that, certainly the, uh, the management team of the NEC vehemently disagree with that, and I'm not saying that uh, necessarily that I completely agree with it, but the perception is that from that market and the key people that drive the retail part of this industry and the brands, that they ha- now have an understanding that you know, the NEC is uh, not right for their brand and right, for, and they don't think they get the return on investment. So when you say return on investment then, uh, are we talking about their, their marketing, PR and penetration into the, into the marketplace, or are you talking actually sort of sales on the day? Because that's one thing that the NEC is, has, uh, I understand, encouraged to, to um, put pressure on is actually stop... Uh, the brand's ditching stock is the technical term, yeah. uh, and so on at, at the show. And then consequently, over the, the last four or five years, there's been less and less items to buy. Yeah, I, th- I think that, um, that there is, you know, whenever you do a show, marketing and PR are the benefits. It's the hardest thing to trace because how do you know if someone's walked into your shop, bought a jacket for £200 three weeks after the show because they went to the show and saw that, but they've waited till payday? We can't. You know, track. It's very hard to track. So a lot of uh, the retailers and a lot of the brands do place a um, direct um, uh, importance on the amount they retail each day at the show. And it, it's not just the cost of what... I mean, we lease the space from the venue. We then have to charge per metre to, to be able to make it all work. It's you know, quite basic maths. It's just dealing with feet and inches, really. Um, but from the association cost with the brands is that they've then got their hotel bills for um, either the Hilton or Crown Plaza. They've then got their on-site costs of building all the stand and the representation of the graphics and everything else, the merchandising, and then the staff out of the offices. So it's what they're losing on their shop floors. So it does put a lot of pressure on three days of concentrated sales. So whilst I, you know, I, I know many of them are quite prepared to write off a certain amount of money against marketing and PR benefits and they want to support the industry. I think there is a tipping point as to 
how much they put against that and whether they can um, get more cut through or perceived cut through doing other things. I think certainly as you know, media has taken a bit of battering over the last year and a half that things are cheaper, such as you know, pages in magazines, such as you know, uh, broadcast media is cheaper to advertise on and things will go back to a normal level uh, over a period of time. But I think if I'm going to pinpoint anything, about four years ago we actually had every major retailer and every major brand probably with the same amount of attendees that are out there now. So what happened was one year I think a lot of people got their fingers burnt with the show and a lot of people missed their projected revenue targets by a large amount. And unfortunately with events you get one go a year. So everybody's memory is quite long and it's not that you've got an advert wrong and next month you'll give someone compensation and give them a double page spread. You've got a year to then persuade them that actually... Yeah, you've learned from whatever the problem was and, and, and adapted. So uh, am I reading that right in the sense that the, the majority of the people you've mentioned are actually London-based companies and therefore that's one of the key financial reasons that they're happy to consider having the show in London and supporting the show in London rather than coming outside of the, outside of the city? Not necessarily London-based companies. You know, Berghaus, for example, are based in uh, uh, Sunderland. Um, but they do have, um, certainly retailers, they do have their major stores in London. So um, you know, whilst they have you know, major stores all over the country, that their concentration in their flagship stores tend to be, um, for the bigger guys, in London. So it's easier for them to staff and to service and they save on the hotel bills and transport costs. But I, I suppose the thing is, is that... Um, it, it's, it's not whether it's a, 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 a Midlands thing or a London thing. It's the perceived perception, I think, from that four years ago when that show um, didn't deliver for so many brands. And you know, one of the things we were very careful to think about is that actually picking it up from the NEC and dropping it in Excel is that it is all the problems fixed. And it, it's actually m much more layered than that. And the reason... That, that we made the decision to go to Excel was, was because the boat show um, uh, approached us and we had a long consultation where we identified that they would be a good fit to go alongside. They identified us as a good fit. Um, and the, the weekend that we're going to move to is the second weekend of their event. Um, we will increase the, the event to four days instead of the three, offering retailers another day of, uh, of footfall. And the boat show attendance over those three days is, is just about 60,000 people. Given that we attract 35,000 to this event, it's hoped that the combined audiences and actually getting the right profile of people is that we can create a, a show that for £13.50 in advance, you'll be able to go to the boat show, the outdoor show and our newly launched bike show for the same ticket where you'll be able to walk all the way through. And I think that alone is a proposition to both a visitor and to a retailer and to a brand, suddenly is um, far stronger than offering them just a three-day show um, in its current format. I suppose the only other thing that's that's missing in that calculation then is the the fact the footfall footfall for this show because of its location, um, obviously getting people coming from possibly the Lake District, Manchester area, uh, as well as uh, Oxford and and sort of Wales. Um, or will they be prepared to travel down to to XL, or alternatively, are you going to have enough of a draw of an audience in, in the locality down there? Well, I mean, what I would really like to do is to offer um, the opportunity for our existing customers to um, to be able to have a subsidised rate to come to the show at Excel. And there will be a marketing strategy that will very much target our loyal customers and to give them uh, the value of you know, this show and a day out and to, to have the experience. We will work with local hotels to work on subsidised rates as well, so you'll be able to buy a weekend ticket for the event, um, where, given the size of the new show, it, it can be a weekend destination. And I think that you know, whilst London has a bigger catchment area, that we certainly don't want to lose our core enthusiasts, the people that um, live and breathe the outdoors. And it, it's incredibly important, and certainly as Excel's transport link improve with the Olympics that um, from I think let me get this right I think the end of the year there will be a javelin train from uh, King's Cross St Pancras which will take you to Stratford and then it's seven in seven minutes and it's ten minutes to excel from there so actually transport wise a train coming down from the north is quicker to get to excel than it is to get to Earl's Court um, and that's quite important in terms of uh, how 
London is uh, the access to XL and, and how you can get uh, into the venue itself. So finally, then, just to, to conclude, the, um, we can look forward to a show at uh, what kind of dates? You haven't actually mentioned the dates. Nancy. It's the 13th to 16th of January. So it's the second weekend of the boat show. It's slightly earlier than we are now, but given the opportunity for this co-location, um, I think that it was too compelling as to, to not to take the opportunity. Um, one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that uh, something that's very, very key to what the show will become and the future of it. I mean, we've talked a lot about location, we talked a lot about audience and retailers and everything else, but I think that in recent years, and certainly what we've been bought as a business, is that the outdoor show actually started losing its way a little bit, in that it become a little bit too much full of um, adrenaline, have a go, throw yourself into this. And it's very children-focused, which is good, because we want to bring the families. But I think that we neglected um, the core of the walking market and about the advice, the workshops, the, you know, the, the walking clinics, the things uh, such as you know, working with the National Trust and the RSPCB and, and actually understanding what our customers want. Who are our customers and what do they come to a show for? And one of the things that is um, key to the future growth of what we're doing is uh, the editorial. And um, this year we've got the likes of uh, Joe Simpson and Kate Humble, James Cracknell, Ben Fogel speaking. The idea is that we um, build on this theatre, offer it to a larger market and actually bring some of the names that um, people would genuinely want to see that they couldn't see anywhere else. So, for example, we've already um, signed contracts with uh, Sir Ranoff Fines and Sir Chris Boddington for next year. And it's a case of adding to those names the breadth of people that, that people would want to see. And there you have it, another podcast containing a wealth of interviews relating to anything to do with the outdoors. Uh, we'd love some feedback if people have any suggestions of content of uh, what they'd like to hear in the future. We've got a whole variety of people we're hoping to, to speak to. Please do drop us a line at info at theoutdoorstation.co.uk uh, or um, visit us on Facebook, of course. As I mentioned in the previous uh, podcast, we are also uh, being nominated for the European Podcast Awards, which do require a few votes, if that's, uh, if you can spare me a couple of minutes to do that. And there's links to the voting procedure, uh, both on Backpacking Light and also on the Outdoor Station. And it's a simple click, and uh, that's about it, I think, really, to, to vote. So uh, I'd appreciate that if you can spare the time. There certainly seems to be plenty going on in the outdoors world, uh, which is good to see. And it's good to see that people are getting out and uh, improving their own, their own health and fitness, as well as appreciating uh, our surroundings and uh, looking after our surroundings as well, which is a good thing. So uh, I shall be back with uh, more interesting and diverse content related to the outdoors. In the meantime, I hope you're uh, taking time to uh, stop working for a change and get out into the, uh, into the fresh air and enjoy what we have around us. So until next time folks thanks for listening thanks for downloading thanks for voting and catch you later bye for now if you have any feedback questions or suggestions why not drop us a line either on facebook or directly to our email address info at the outdoorstation.co.uk the home of uk-based audio and video podcasts for outdoors people everywhere This independent programme is produced and hosted by theoutdoorsstation.co.uk.